introducing the Crystal Clear Ebel, presented by Alex Deacon and Matthew Irvin of the Wessex River Trust. Join Alex and Matt as they explore the unique importance of the River Ebel and showcase why chalk streams are such rare and important habitats and how we can conserve them. So hopefully everybody can see me and can see the presentation that we've got up. So the um, presentation is called Introducing the River Ebel. So thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Matthew Irvine, the Project Officer for the Rivers Avon and Stour. And joining me tonight, as Roland just mentioned, is my colleague and the Wessex Rivers Trust Catchment Coordinator, Alex Deacon. We hope this talk will increase your knowledge of chalk streams and add to your appreciation of our beautiful River Ebel. And later in the presentation, we'll also tell you how you can get involved. So a little bit about the River Ebel. The River Ebel is a small, approximately 22 kilometre tributary of the Hampshire Avon. The river rises from springs at Berwick St John and flows east through the villages of Ebsbourne Wake, Fifthfield Bavance, Broad Chalk, Bishopstone, Coombe Bissett, Hommington, Oddstock and Nunton, and joining the River Avon at Bowdenham with the Longford, within the Longford Estates. The river is split into two distinct sections. The ephemeral Winterbourne, which is a section above the crest beds at Broad Chalk. This section only flows when the aquifer levels are above a certain capacity. Due to this, this section of the river supports a unique ecology of flora and invertebrates adapted to extreme flow variations. Uh, the second section of the river is the perennial section below the crest beds at Broad Chalk, which flows all year round. The valley below Broad Chalk is generally broader, with a wider floodplain historically dominated by water meadows. These have now been drained and mostly converted to pastoral agriculture. However, many maintain their ridge and furrow heritage. Um, and for those not familiar with the categorizations, an ephemeral or winterborne stream, as the name suggests, is that part of the river that only flows a part of the year based on groundwater levels. And the perennial section is that part of the river that flows all year round. Um, the Ebel's perennial flow begins near Mount Sorrel, which is approximately the crest breads in Broad Chalk, um, where it is joined by the Chalk Valley stream, or I believe locally it's called the River Mead, which is a small perennial stream, which contributes significantly to the flow of the Ebel throughout the year. So what makes the Ebel so special? Well, it's a globally rare chalk stream. In fact, one of only 160 in the UK, which actually make up 80% of the world's uh, chalk rivers total. Chalk streams are rare, biodiverse ecosystems supporting an array of wildlife. Chalk Valley is famous for its tranquility, rich cultural history, and also its wild brown trout fly fishing. The River Abel is designated as one of the country's only wild fish protection zones in recognition of its natural trout population, meaning the Environment Agency do not allow any artificial stocking of the river from its source to its confluence with the River Avon. However, unlike most of the Avon's main tributaries, the Ebel is not designated as either a triple SI or an SAC, which is a, a site of special scientific interest or a special area of conservation. And so receives less legal um, or environmental protection and scrutiny as many nearby chalk streams. The Ebel Valley is, however, part of the Cranbourne Chase AONB. And so the valley's landscape and natural heritage receive a degree of protection within the local planning system due to this. So what is a chalk stream? Well, chalk is a very porous form of limestone, which means that it is able to soak up and hold water, uh, much like a sponge. Water moves and percolates through the chalk in cracks called fissures to form and fill underground aquifers or reservoirs. And it can take anywhere between 20 or to 40 years for the water to fill through these rocks. Uh, once full, the aquas over overflow at ground level in the form of springs that form the chalk streams as we know them. Passage through the rock for water is relatively slow and it smooths out any irregularities in rainfall. And as a result, chalk streams tend to have a regular annual flow regime with a relatively small difference between winter and summer flows and very little in the way of spate conditions as, it, as they should receive very little surface runoff. The temperature range in the chalk streams remains relatively constant and cool all year round and is closer to the annual mean than in most rivers receiving more surface runoff. The water is calcareous with a pH of around 7.4 to 8 and an ample supply of plant nutrients. This means the streams support diverse and productive communities of plants and animals and the restricted temperature range is particularly suitable for the growth of salmonids such as the brown trout. So uh, what makes a healthy chalk stream. Um, one of the main things here is 
uh, it's in its most natural form, if you like, because the water's clean and pure and uh, it's fed by very little surface runoff. So the flow coming out of that chalk aquifer uh, needs to be sufficient so that once above ground, um, the flow should also be unobstructed. So due to their low gradients, even a, a small obstruction on a chalk stream, something like a weir or a sluice, um, can have quite a significant impact on the natural course of that stream. Um, one of the important things here to consider as well in a healthy chalk stream is the river channel itself and the floodplain shouldn't be viewed in, in separately, if you like. They're, they're, uh, a healthy chalk stream is a well-connected river and floodplain. They work uh, and interact together. So you typically would see a, a, um, the river channel gradually making its way to a, a, a marginal bank full of emergent vegetation, which is known as the riparian zone, and then a, a low-level floodplain with a, a diversity of uh, plants due to its seasonally wet nature. Um, but for this to happen, the river needs to have uh, room to thrive, as we call it, but it's, it's space within the floodplain to, uh, to, to, to naturally move and migrate and, and do what rivers do. And that's, uh, that's one of the, sort of the key, key things there. So chalk streams in the news, this is something you, you may have come across over in the newspapers in recent years uh, and online. It's been quite a hot topic in terms of the river environment. Um, and a lot has been said. So it's um, the, main, the reason for this is, is because they're vulnerable and uh, they're also, as Matt said, that they're, they're very rare habitats, they're globally rare. So they are under, under threat from a number of different directions. And our current understanding is, is a combination of, uh, of pollution, both urban and um, from rural areas as well, uh, unsustainable abstraction um, and, and physical modifications by uh, by humans both both past and present and these have combined uh, have had quite a negative effect on these on these unique rivers and often it's worth pointing out often these these sort of issues are often interacting it's not just one um having having the kind of overriding effect they often um work in you know in, together if you like to to have that negative impact so where do these threats come from so um I think one of the main things is uh, is increasing populations, uh, particularly in the southeast of England, um, where many of the, the nation's chalk streams are found as well, and around the Thames catchment, for example, has re resulted in an increase in abstraction for, for drinking water and uh, an increase in the amount of raw um, and also treated uh, effluent that is discharged into the rivers. Um, we, you know, we're very reliant on, on our groundwater supplies here. Um, uh, but uh, arguably there's not been enough investment made over the years towards securing alternative water resources, such as reservoirs, things like that. Um, and also it changes to land use, um, both the land itself, but also also the river has, has, has changed over many years. And in some ways, in some areas, it's done been done very, um, uh, you know, with, with very little regard for nature, if you like, and building directly on the floodplain in places that are either whether it's prone to flooding or also just in some really you know, important areas and habitats. Um, in, invasive species as well, that's uh, something that's become very, you know, in some areas, very, very well established over time. Um, uh, so that's also proven to be, have some really rather negative effects on our native wildlife. Um, and one of the other things there is, is, is particularly in the past, is, is intensive agricultural practices. Um, due to the amount of time it takes water to move through the chalk aquifer, which is often decades, um, we're now typically seeing the effects of, of things like excessive fertilizer use from back in the 70s and 80s, um, when farming was undertaken in, in a more intensive manner in, in, some, parts of, in some parts of the country. Thanks, Alex. So many of the problems facing the nation's rivers aren't unique to the chalk streams. But what are these challenges facing our rivers going forwards? So they come from many different directions and have differing impacts on the rivers and streams, which I'll cover in more detail in a moment. But the main threats come from issues relating to water quality, physical modifications, invasive non-native species, water quantity, and the river's ability to adapt to climate change. Historic use has changed and many of the management practices are no longer in use, but these structures still remain in place. So water quality, what can affect water quality? 
well, it's not just about pollution by chemicals. Lots of things impact the quality of water in our rivers. Our rivers are polluted by sediment loss from fields. Soil loss costs the world economy over 300 billion pounds a year and smothers river habitat. Now, I've got two photos here. The, the top photo you can see was actually taken in the, the Nadder Valley. So it's a neighbouring valley. Hence, the soil may look a bit different there, but that's basically soil running off a, off a field straight down a road. And at the bottom of the road is the, is the stream and it's going straight into the stream. And the bottom photo where on the left hand side of the photo, you can see that you've got what is a spring fed ditch running into the River Ebble. And on the right of the same picture is the actual River Ebble, which looks like much like a cup of tea. Um, and this was probably about six weeks ago after a, um, a heavy bout of rain. So um, we do get these, these problems in the Ebble Valley. Um, but also we've got the leg legacy effect of fertilizers um, from the increased uh, production drive 30 years ago. As Alex mentioned, these are now reaching our chalk streams. And each year, water companies discharge sewage in, into our rivers. In 2019 alone, there was 204,000 um, sewage discharges into UK rivers. This equates to 1.53 million hours of waste discharge into our into UK rivers each year. And to put that into context, there's, there's 8,000 hours in a year. So 1.53 million hours um, is a lot of rivers being pumped full of sewage the whole time. Um, I know that's not how it works, but just to put it into context, it's 1.53 million hours of waste discharges is quite significant. Fortunately, though, there's only one sewage treatment works on the Ebble and the storm overflow didn't, charge, didn't discharge at all that year. Um, so the Ebble doesn't take a great deal of untreated wastewater. However, um, there's a lot of septic tanks um, up and down the river and these may be having an effect. I mean, the community, I can't say the word, the effects of um, septic tanks are sort of a little research because it depends on the efficiency of the septic tank when it was last emptied and they should be um, putting clean water out, but whether that's always the case. Physically modified river channels. So the likes of the Ebble Valley have been the lifeblood of our communities for thousands of years, and we've altered their natural course and modified the shape of the channel to suit our needs at any given point in history. For example, many of the chalk streams in the Avon catchment possessed fully functioning water meadows, a human intervention, but one that also provided many wildlife benefits. Um, and while these water meadows are no longer in use, as I mentioned a minute ago, many of these structures are actually still there. And now they're having a detrimental effect on the rivers because they're no, they, they no longer used how they were. Um, the unintended consequence of land drainage and agriculture intensification re removes a lot of valuable diversity and habitat from our rivers and floodplains. Rivers were straightened and deepened to improve capacity, but this actually reduced conveyance, meaning rivers become smothered in beds of silt. Natural process uh, was reduced as a consequence and habitat becomes a monoculture leading to a decrease in biodiversity. Here's a useful diagram. Um, the top channel is a channel that's been, been dredged and uh, we would call it um, a trapezoidal channel. So it's been, great, it's been dug out to have as much capacity as possible. Um, but it, due to this, it has very little um, shape or diversity. Um, and therefore it doesn't have those differing habitats that a, a river channel needs. The bottom picture, is a much more diverse in many ways, offering refuge at both low and high flows and provides plenty of habitats for the many, many different species and life stages that rely on these habitat niches. And just because a river's shallower and not as, say it doesn't look as big as the, the channel above, um, it will still take the same amount of water downstream because the channel at the bottom, because it's shallower, will flow faster than the channel at the top. So you, you're not necessarily achieving anything by adding additional capacity to a to a river channel other than slowing the flow down and, um, and uh, reducing the amount of available habitat. So there's, there's many historic barriers um, and weirs still exist on our chalk streams and rivers. And um, the Ebbo is, is, is no exception. It, um, there's, a, there's a large weir just before its confluence with the River Avon. Um, but I think the, the thing to point out here is that both small and large barriers um, can cause a, a wide range of issues, not just for migratory fish, like you can see in the, in the image there, um, but also natural processes such as the natural flow of the water, but also things like sediment transport, which are actually you know, really important. Um, all species of fish, it's worth pointing out, need to be able to move uh, freely up and down our river systems to be able to complete their life cycles. 
Um, and so in-channel barriers can, can block migration. Um, and as a result of that, that can one thing it can do is, is stop fish reaching those those things like spawning grounds, but it can also reduce the um, the genetic mixing of fish populations, and it can isolate certain populations within the river. And uh, that means then if you have something like a pollution event, then you know those barriers can prevent other fish from from moving freely and, and recolonizing those reaches. Um, as I said, barriers also block natural processes, so removing um, the, the gradient from a reach of river um, and, and prevent tra sediment transport um, means that those those kind of typically shining beds of gravel that you see in our chalk streams can become quite smothered with silt, um, which is is clogs up all the all the, all the gaps between the between the gravel, which is which is where a lot of the insects um, live and and, and and young fish and things like that. So uh, again, within its own right, important piece of habitat. Um, and barriers also make the river uh, deeper, closer to that structure, and they remove the amount of habitat available, including some of that marginal vegetation. So this is a this is quite a handy little diagram, which is it shows the impounding effects of, of in-channel barriers, weirs and sluices, etc. Um, as you can see from the diagram, downstream of that barrier, there's a there's a, a diversity of habitat. Um, a bit like it was shown in, in Matt's previous slide. And this is reflected in the, in the biodiversity of a, of a river. And then typically just upstream there in that impounded reach of a, a riverbed that is often smothered in silt and has a lot less variation in, in, in the flow and a sort of rather uniform sort of riverbed um, and also just general channel shape, which provides much less habitat. So one of the other uh, pressures on our rivers, as we touched on, is, is invasive non-native species, which you might hear referred to as INS. Um, and they're generally termed a, a species that have been introduced to the UK and have escaped into the wild where they're naturalised um, and have a, have a detrimental effect on, on our native wildlife. Um, and many species, or non-native species, occur across the UK. Um, but I think our current understanding for the EBL, the most prevalent ones, are the Himalayan balsam, um, uh, signal crayfish, the American signal crayfish, I should say, and um, Japanese knotweed as well, and also the American mink. So you probably, a few of you will probably be quite familiar with some of these, um, but these, these plant species um, that we find along our rivers tend to have been introduced historically by um, well, explorers a very long time ago, but more recently through through being sold at our garden centres and then them making their way to people's gardens and then um, their invasive nature means they've spread. So things like Japanese knotweed actually, we found out actually won a, a gold medal in 1847 from the Society of Agriculture and Horticulture in Holland when it is officially recognised as, uh, as being um, um, uh, basically one of the uh, a particularly good species for holding the ground together. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think they realised the, the the impact it would have on on people's houses, but also uh, also rivers and their and their wildlife. Um, but one that's probably more familiar with is, is Himalayan balsam, which admittedly can look um, rather rather pretty and quite nice on um, our river river banks and gardens, and provides a source of pollen for bees. Um, but it spreads particularly uh, particularly effectively along our watercourses, and um, and it's. Uh, well, it can dominate riverbanks. It grows very, very quickly indeed. And the problem is, is it outcompetes a lot of our uh, native species um, of flora and takes over the riverbanks. Um, it's an annual plant that grows very fast and is shallow rooted. So what that means is that at the end of each growing season where it has outcompeted those native vegetation, um, the riverbanks are left bare, which leaves the bank very prone to erosion. And uh, some of the uh, other non-natives we see in the catchment, um, again, you may have come across these in, in the, in the Ebble Valley or elsewhere in the Avon catchment. Um, the top one there is the American mink, which is uh, a mustelid and shouldn't be confused with our native uh, polecat or the otter. Um, and it's had a, quite a devastating effect on our, on our wildlife populations and places. And again, originally uh, brought over here as a, as a captive animal, but for the, for the fur trade and uh, some escaped but many were internationally, uh, sorry, intentionally um, released by animal rights activists 
and some of you may be aware there's a, a release of, of mink in the 90s i believe from a, a mink farm on the lower avon which um has had quite a detrimental impact on the on the avon water vole population um, and then down below there's the is the american signal crayfish um these uh these are also bought over from from the states as a source of food and um many were just thrown into rivers to be harvested at a later date um uh, these these uh, signal crayfish there are a lot more um, aggressive and, and larger than our native white claw crayfish and again um they, they out compete um our, our, the native crayfish but the american crayfish also carry a disease which has had a, a, a again a really big impact on on the native on the native species um and has and has virtually wiped wiped the native species out from a lot of our rivers and possibly also also the ebble um so yeah it's a, a very effective uh, predator it can also eat things like fish eggs so it provide it, it's a it's a it's a it's a real pest um uh and it can travel over land get over weirs and it can burrow, burrow into the the banks of the river which again a bit like the balsam can increase uh, increase the erosion of the of the channel so one of the other issues that we we see in again is is uh, is water quantity so this is both flooding but also low flows um it's it's not just about unsustainable abstraction either um chalk streams are, are, are typically as we said characterized by a steady flow of of, of, of uh, ground fed water so climate change can make these fluctuations um basically more extreme and, and more frequent um as we get more and more um uh, volatile weather conditions as we've seen over the last uh, few years um you know we're experiencing heavier prolonged rainfall events which is leading to, to flash flooding washing soil off the fields and inundating some of our drainage systems and each summer we experience hotter drier weather with very real threat of drought hanging over us um so uh, particularly if we don't get a good amount of rain over the winter and it's also worth pointing out the physical modifications to our rivers have made them a lot less resilient to the extremes of, of the impacts of climate change in these high flows or, or particularly uh, low flows. And it's just basically reduced the, the, the capability to, to deal with those fluctuations and changes. Sorry, I was on mute for a moment there. Um, how does this all link to the apple? Um, well, the Ebble has been uh, subjected to significant human modification, both historic and recent. The valley itself was shaped during the last glacial period, when the underlying chalk was frozen, less permeable, and subject to much higher rates of erosion. In the subsequent interglacial period, the thawed and now permeable chalk gave rise to a relatively stable ground-fed flow, creating a wet marshland through the valley bottom, and this was cut with a complex network of an anastomizing or braided, braided rivulets. It was first modified by humans in pre-Roman times, but more intensively during the medieval period. The valley was formalized into a larger main channel with minor carriers, leaks and feeds, diverting water for milling and water meadow agriculture. Eventually, these water meadows would also be drained to accommodate modern agricultural practices and the burgeoning settlements and associated in infrastructure along the valley bottom. And today, what is the river like? Well, the ecology of the Ebble faces a number of challenges, including the impacts of both historic and modern land use, as well as more widespread systematic threats, such as biodiversity decline and climate change. Marginal biodiversity is significantly limited in some places by channel modifications, intensive management, and or intensive grazing. We are fortunate that many of the landowners and farmers in the Ebble Valley have a much more sympathetic outlook on managing their land with nature in mind, However, we are still suffering the legacy effects of the drive to produce more food 30 to 40 years ago. But also today, fine sediment runoff from agriculture and hard surfaces is impacting the water quality um, via increased nutrient loads and affecting pollution sensitive invertebrate species and degrading important spawning habitat for trout and other gravel spawning fish. Tree cover is sparse in some reaches, potentially impacting water temperature and dissolved oxygen levels during hot and dry periods limiting the river's resilience to climate change. And the hydrology of the catchment has also doubtlessly been impacted by soil erosion 
and compaction associated with intensive agriculture. Fortunately, there are sections with the Ebel that are in very good condition, less impacted by runoff, more sensitively managed and rich with biodiverse margins. And these reaches can serve as a template highlighting the fantastic potential the Ebel has as an archetypal small short stream. The Ebel has the capacity to become a gin clear river with clean gravels and diverse floral margins from source to confluence, teeming with invertebrates and fish and supporting a wide range of amphibians, birds and mammals, including people. So I'm going to introduce you to a bit of the wildlife now. Um, we have many native and iconic species of animals up and down the River Ebble. Um, we're going to introduce a few of those characters. Now, hopefully, what I'm going to have to do, because we've tried this, is um, I'm going to get these up because they won't show through the presentation. So I'm going to try and change my screen sharing options if I can. Um, right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to start sharing again in a moment because I just need to get some videos up. I don't know if I can get these. All right, I'll try that. I'm going to pause that. Okay. Uh, it just wants to be my screen, doesn't it? Uh, nope. <laughs> Can you see that? Okay, they don't seem to be working. So um, yeah, we can, we'll try and share the videos with the presentation afterwards. Um, unfortunately, um, and are you now all just seeing the presentation or have you got my notes up as well? Okay. I know, I know. This is it's all happening in the wrong order. Right. Let's try again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that should hopefully. And hopefully you can all see that again. So we we did have some otters and vertebrates herons, fish, and some plant species videos to show you, but they don't seem to be, oh, I can't seem to get them up to work. So <laughs> we'll, we'll leave those in the, in, the, um, in the presentation and you can have a look at a later date when it's um, been released. So what can we do? I'm just gonna hand over to us. So the Crystal Clearable project, like, um... Like Roland touched on, it's a, it's, a, it's a heritage lottery funded project and it's part of this larger Cranbourne Chase Chalk and Chalk Valley Landscape Partnership. So the Wessex Rivers Trust, we're working with Wiltshire Wildlife Trust um, and uh, FWAG Southwest, uh, you're the Farming Wildlife and Advisory Group Southwest, just to say. Um, and the Crystal Clear Able is ultimately aimed at improving um, both our understanding of the river, but also trying to figure out what it is that we can do collectively to make it a, a healthier a healthier chalk stream. So when is it happening? Well, basically it's kicking off now and it's running for the next three and a half uh, years. Um, and uh, obviously, unfortunately, it's, it's a difficult time to be starting to try and, and kick off a project, which is we'd like to get you all in, involved in um, with the current restrictions in place. But obviously, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll have some opportunities for that. Um, and we can we can really you know meet some meet some faces on on the on the riverbank. So to achieve this plan, uh, we're going to carry out a series of ecological surveys to understand the health of the river, 
and, uh, and, and create a, an up-to-date baseline um, of data. So one of the things we've noticed here when we're looking into seeing what data was available for the river, um, there was there was there's quite a lot available that's been collected over the years. But as some of you may be aware, as, as, as the government funding has, has decreased for um, the environmental agency, um, uh, we've been unable to basically fund the same frequency of monitoring. So there hasn't actually been a lot of monitoring done over the last few years, um, which means one of the key things here is, is getting out there and carrying out some surveys to find out where we are and, and what the current status is. So we want to, like I said, work with, um, with, with landowners and local volunteers to, to train you in some of these surveys, and then we can start to replicate them um, year on year. And ultimately, with that data in place, that can inform decision-making process and what actions we need to take. And one of the things also worth pointing out is we're going to be doing um, some, some education programs with the local schools as well, because um, you know, we've got a good opportunity here to, to um, engage with the younger generation and, and, um, and get them hopefully spark their interest um, for, for looking after this river in, uh, in future years. So how can you get involved? Well, do you have an interest in wildlife, conservation and our chalk streams? There are a number of different ways you can help protect and enhance the animals through our project. So through surveys and volunteering, um, you can help us to improve our understanding of the Avalanx wildlife, as that's going to be key to informing any decisions or ideas we have uh, going forward. So what actions need to be taken on the ground? Um, we would love to hear from you if you'd like to get involved. Um, and we'll offer free training and practical advice um, around the river. Um, we're also offering free training to volunteers and river wardens. So um, if you're a landowner in the Chalk Valley or your garden borders the banks of the Ebble, we can offer free advice and support on how you can help manage your land for the benefit of the river. Um, currently, we are able, we are unable to get out on the bank and work with volunteers in any sort of groups, obviously due to the to the current climate, but based on current government roadmap, we'll be able to get out there with you in May. So we will be releasing a few dates for training very soon. Um, in the meantime, we are working on a few ideas that will enable volunteers to get involved remotely. Um, so just keep your eyes um, peeled for how we can do that. And that's, that's the end of our presentation. Thank you to Alex Deacon and Matt Irving for presenting this talk as part of the Spring Talk series, hosted by the Chase and Chalk Landscape Partnership Scheme. Thank you to our partners and funders for this talk. The Chase and Chalk Landscape Partnership is a group of organisations working together to protect and enhance the special landscape of Cranbourne Chase and the Chalk Valley. With Cranbourne Chase AONB as the lead partner, and with support from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, this five-year partnership is working with local communities to better connect people with the landscape. For more information, please visit www.cranbournechase.org.uk.